our launch day was just something that I will never forget and probably why I said this is one of my proudest um, <laughs> collections. Welcome back, everybody, to the Creator Partnerships podcast. Today, I have Terry Simone. If you haven't seen the show before, then what we try to do here is steal the best learnings about how to start and scale uh, creator partnerships by bringing the smartest people we can possibly find um, uh, and stealing all of their secrets. So uh, today we brought Terry, who is a founding team member and head of marketing and design, if I remember your title correctly, yep. um, uh, and very thoughtful creator partnerships manager uh, underneath all of that. Um, the prep, the best prepped guest we've ever seen and some of the <laughs> coolest stories that I've ever seen in the prep doc. So really excited to dive in. Um, yeah. Do you want to give a little intro to yourself and to, and to new since I, I skipped right over what new is, but um, I leave it to you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Avery. Really excited to, to be here and share some awesome tidbits. Um, tell you a bit about new first and then sort of who I am and why I'm here talking to you. Uh, new Cabinet Doors, we are a direct-to-consumer custom cabinet door company. So you have an existing kitchen, you're maybe not in love with it anymore. It looks like grandma's dated doors. We make you custom doors that will fit the existing cabinets you have, ship them right to your home, and we have the tools and resources to teach you how to DIY it yourself. Uh, we also are fully compatible with IKEA systems. So for people looking to kind of zhuzh up a more box store looking product, we can make custom doors that seamlessly integrate with IKEA's product. So we're kind of a cool, we're trying to make rectangles, which aren't inherently fun, fun. And that's a big part of what I do here. I've been a marketer, I think, since I was eight years old and was ripping apart uh, weight loss flyers uh, to my parents. I would do presentations on, you know, why this wasn't <laughs> OK, aside from just weight loss marketing being horrible. Uh, I, I would do little uh, presentations most evenings. Um, I'm a weirdo, so hopefully that'll come out a little bit <laughs> in today's chat. But I really think that in what I do here and in how we approach creator partnerships, that there's just so much human connection that can happen, both in how we work with our creators and also how we can market to people in a way that feels really good and natural and is helping them uh, versus just selling them stuff. So I'm really excited to dig into this today and uh, hopefully share some really neat uh, tidbits with the audience. Absolutely. So building a little more context on top of that about new, can you tell us a little bit kind of the stage of the company? Where's the team at today? And how do creator partnerships kind of look from super high level? Uh, at the moment? Yeah, so we are a young, fast growing company. Uh, we have a small team here. Um, management side, customer service side, we're ever expanding, which is a really fun place to be in a, in a young company. And at a, at a high level, our creator partnerships have really been wide ranging. We've done everything from, you know, five or 10K followers with a discount on product to we have a co-branded product line with one of the top DIY and design influencers in the industry. Uh, we sort of sprinkled in some HGTV uh, talent partnerships in there too. That's a whole world <laughs> to exist in. <laughs> um, and even we've been fortunate to work with Bobby Burke from Queer Eye. So uh, real real bit of everything in terms of how we've come at uh, partnerships and a lot of learning from from every scale. Yeah. And if you're trying to figure out whether you should tune in, I mean, outside of Terry and New being super impressive, I think it'll be fun to go through some of those very specific cases of uh, how a partnership came to be, what was its purpose and so on. So if you're interested to to hear what it's like to play in the more complex spaces of creator partnerships and how to think about those like co-branded products, like you mentioned, or bigger kind of PR, uh, like superstar level uh, partnerships, I, I would say, um, then uh, this is a great show to to stay tuned into. Um, fantastic. Are you ready for some quick warm up questions before we dive into co creating? I'm ready. All right. So the first question is, what's one thing, or in your case, th what's three things you <laughs> wish more people understood about influencer marketing? Okay, quick answers. It's not just a performance channel. It is hard to measure. It's flipping hard to measure sometimes slash a lot of the time. Um, and the network effect. So influencers are a network to the audiences that they're marketing to, but they also have such a network effect within their own spheres. So whether that be their management agencies, 
other creators who are in the same sphere or other creators in adjacent spheres. Massive network effect that is often not really even clocked by brands who are considering stepping into this. Totally. I actually love that one. I think it's really thoughtful. Like the, um, yeah, uh, the network effect idea, how the channel compounds over time, the more you do it uh, is pretty powerful. So for good or bad. Very... So it's, uh, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Much like customer relationships, maybe how you treat your creator partnerships um, will compound in the same way that treating your customers well or poorly compounds over time. And I think it's uh, we all like working with people that we like to work with. Right. And we don't want to work (laughs) with people that we don't want to work with. So something to keep in mind if, if you have a great partnership that can go miles in terms of them telling a friend or a colleague. Totally agree. One of your favorite brand creator collabs could be one of yours, could be someone else's, just one that stands out to you that you're particularly proud of or think was cool. I mean, I'm particularly proud of our brand creator collab with Angela Rose. Um, I know we'll get into that. That one just makes my heart so happy. There's such an alignment of values and goals. And yeah, that's my favorite. I'm biased, but that's my favorite. (laughs) Awesome. We love that one. And it's a good teaser for the rest of the show. Um, and do you have a favorite creator, somebody that you find yourself watching in the evening after a hard day's work? Yeah. So I love Chicken Shop Date. Um, I don't know how <laughs> familiar you are. I think that the content is just amazing. The concept is so interesting. And the just the storytelling that comes out of that, the the guests that have come on the show... It's just, it's such a fun, it's so fun. I just, I, yeah, I'm yeah. chicken shop date. If you don't know what it is, uh, go check it out. You'll have the best time. Listen to an episode. Yeah. that's It all is episode. awesome. I, <laughs> I'd seen it in my feed in the past and I, I, it's obviously a huge show, so I've heard of it. Um, but I hadn't really sat and watched a whole episode until today. Um, and I went and I watched it and I thought, this is genius. This is amazing. It's so fun. Every, everything that can be great about content is great about this content. It, and especially yeah. an interview show. They hand, she handles oh, it so man. well. And it's yeah, she, so and I cool. think I think I saw, I'm going to get the awards show wrong, but I think she hosted like, not the Oscars, but she was yeah, one of the like red something. carpet interviewers or something. Because I also saw her yeah. doing just really fun interview style on like a big name show so props yeah i thought the same content. thing when i watched the show today i thought i've definitely seen this face she before, might have been at the oscars where they do the like sort of warm-up interviewee bits on the red carpet i feel like i saw her there last year but but it is amazing a great recommendation go check out chicken shop dates and some of the episodes are like six minutes so uh, there's yeah. so many great lessons for content marketers in that show too like if you really think about what's happening in the content and what she's doing is just, it's genius. Um, yeah. I love it. Great choice. My, maybe my favorite pick so far of everyone we've asked that question. Nice. Um, <laughs> okay. Into the hard stuff. All right. We're warmed up. Let's do it. Let, let's go into a, a hardcore combative interview here. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I want to talk about this co-creation thing that you've been up to because I haven't had the chance to talk to a lot of people who've done this very well. And it seems like you've done it very well a couple times. Um, so tell us a little bit about the Angela Rose X new project. Yeah. So the Angela Rose home partnership is three years old. Let's say three years old. I think that's correct (laughs) at this point. Um, And Angela Rose Home is a DIY and design influencer. So really started on primarily Instagram. Um, Her entire slogan is stop pinning, start doing. And I mean, really, I could just stop there and, you you know, perfect. Yep. (laughs) Aligned. Off we go. Um, the, The goal of the Angela Rose Home platform is to empower people to pick up power tools and people, primarily women. Um, and make their space their own now. So Angela's story is one of, you know, sitting with friends and sort of talking about when I get that next job, when I have that perfect house, when we have the budget, all these sort of what ifs that were getting in, in their own way of really enjoying the space that they were in, whether that was a 
bachelor apartment, whether that was a massive home, that there were always all these reasons that we aren't taking that next step and we aren't making a space that we love. And I mean, we know psych- psychologically that how we treat the space that we are in and what that looks like and feels like to us has such an impact on our mental health that this is also one of those things of it's so easy to put off, but it has such positive benefits when we take that next step. So that's how Angela's platform really came to be was she wanted to learn how to use tools and how to really just dive in and make that space hers now, whatever that looked like. Um, We were fortunate to be introduced to Angela through a, a warm introduction there's such an alignment of our brand is all about you could have a kitchen that costs $100,000 to put in, but most of us don't have $100,000 on a kitchen. And what what can we as a brand do to help our, our customers, friends, have that space now by teaching them a little bit of DIY, by reassuring them that we're going to walk alongside them like friends and and get them through what's really a scary process for a lot of people and let you have that dream space now within the kitchen that you have or within, you know, really just zhuzhing up your Ikea kitchen. Um, There's such an alignment of really just core values for us as a brand and Angela's brand that our first phone call was just, it really felt like we were talking to an old friend. Um, That's a a really fast intro. We'll dig into it more, but that's... That's what we're all about together. Okay, so new is helping people install these custom cabinet doors. You had a great, uh, you had a great line earlier about replacing grandma's uh, dingy doors. Was it? And, yeah, um, I mean, grandma could have style, but a lot of the time, people are like, <laughs> "It's yeah, you know, won't well, bash grandma, but if they look <laughs> like their grandma's house and you don't want them to, we can help." Okay, so new is helping jazz up people's um, cabinet doors throughout the house wherever they may be, uh, and you find Angela Rose. And Angela Rose happens to be telling the story of, you know, put the do and do it yourself. Go and do things. Um, Stop pinning, start doing. Great slogan. Um, You get introduced to her, and it's a love at first sight because uh, this everything just aligns so perfectly. You're trying to get a user to do something, and she's trying to get them to do the same thing. uh, And you're both kind of doing it from this position of, uh, empowering the end customer, which I really love. Um, and so you get this warm intro. How did the warm intro come to be? Was it that you were just sourcing talent, broadly speaking, like kind of doing calls? Or why did you get this intro is maybe my question. Yeah, this was, a, this was an intro through um, and it, sort of an industry advisor. So someone who, you know, knew, knew folks within the industry um, did happen to know Angela. Their paths had crossed. Um, and we had obviously identified Angela as just a really amazing creator. And in our, this was, you know, we were a very young company at this point in our foray into influencer marketing, you know, it was really a, Oh my goodness, wouldn't it be amazing if we could one day work with someone like Angela? (laughs) And it's Uh one of, you know, I talk a lot about in influencer marketing, there's never going to be a right time for things. So if you're listening, you know, it's fine if it feels uncomfortable or, or maybe it's not the right time. If that opportunity comes across your desk, you got to go for it. And this was really one of those of you're not going to turn down that intro. And and we were so fortunate that it really just felt like talking to an old friend. And there was so much mutual excitement to figure out how we could work together. We didn't go into that conversation necessarily thinking that it was going to be coming up with a co-branded line. It really was a, let's get to know each other and see if there's a fit here. And there was such a fit that having this, and maybe I didn't answer your first question, so I'll do that now. We have a collection with Angela Rose. So she has three different doors with us, two that are a painted collection and one that's a wood grain door. And those are the Angela Rose home collection. She did her whole kitchen with them. We've got some really beautiful photography, DIY videos, all of the things. Um, and that's that's branded under our brand and hers in that uh, in that collab. Nice. Okay. And how did you, I'm kind of curious, I'm going a little bit off the rails here already, but I'm just so curious. How did you think about, or how was the process of building a co-branded product in this case? Can you tell a little bit about um, 
what prompted you to to do it that way and and how did the how did it kind of work actually like what was the, the if you had to lay this out on a timeline how does the flow go from intro call great fit let's do something together and then what's the process of building a co-branded product yeah so the the process is a in our case was a was a pretty quick and easy one to be honest it was uh you know a matter of deciding that we were gonna head down this path together and really it just immediately started to iterating on design right so we were coming up with door styles that were going to be branded by angela and you know it was getting samples down it was you know picking out colors so we added her door styles but she also brought three colors across our products so there was a lot of you know I think I like these colors. Let's get those paint tested and send them down. Um, you know, let's make a door that looks like this and then see what you think. So that was really the, probably the the bulk of the, the ideation of what the, the collection was going to look like. Um, that took, you know, a, a few months certainly in, in getting it figured out, but it was pretty, she came in with a really strong vision of what she was looking for in cabinetry. So, so that was really, really helpful and then once we had the you know collection figured out what it was going to look like it was really a matter of of getting product into an existing website which is you know for most e-com platforms pretty straightforward um we launched the collection before she had actually installed her full kitchen so the launch happened after she had done this really big beautiful pantry wall in her kitchen um, you know, we wanted that sort of really exciting installed photo to really kickstart things. But she had been warming people up to the brand for a couple of months before that, just sort of teasing at what we did. And then there was this really like mic drop. And I've launched a collection with the moment with that big pantry. Nice. Wall. So then as that, you know, kitchen project played out, people were able to see, oh, wow, she's using her own line. Look at how nice this looks. Look at how easy it looks all of that. Um, and then, you know, we did sort of those really fancy photo shoot photos post install. So it was sort of a, let's get it live. Let's do this. All the things sort of moving along at the same time. I know some partnerships, it's like a year of prep and photo shoots and video content, and then the collection goes live. I think we we're all just too excited to wait. <laughs> um, and it really, yeah. it really worked out naturally that, that she was working on a kitchen project in tandem. So Love it. So cool. You know, we talk a lot on the show about about how important it is to really treat the partners that you have well. And we already hinted at it in this episode, despite only talking a few minutes. And part of the reason that I think that's so important, sometimes it's useful for people to have the very tactical reasons. For me, it kind of it's natural to want to create the best possible experience for every partner that we have. Um, but one of the reasons that it's so valuable to have those good relationships is it sets um, it sets the foundation, the opportunity for those like serendipitous moments where you can you can then take the next step. So in your case, you were able to have that relationship really quickly because there's such a kind of creator brand fit between you and uh, and Angela. But the, the all I think all companies can learn something from this. Where if you treat all of your creators, no matter how big they are or small they are, uh, with a level of kind of um, respect and and true relationship building, then you earn the right to ask for collaborations like this that are a little bit more in depth and a little bit more uh, high investment and that can kind of do 10 times more than your average Instagram story. Um, so I just think it's really cool that you immediately felt the click and then and then dove in. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's earning the right. The... And it's also it's also earning the, I think, just that that connection, right? We're, mm. we're, you know saying let's walk alongside each other in this thing we're gonna do together people want to do that with a, a, you know a, a business that they trust and i think to your point yeah. there's so much there's so much in how we can come at those conversations and just be as transparent and transparency is huge but also just authentic and excited that we're partnering with people and they want to feel treated like people the second that we take that out of it, and we'll go there later, I know it's you're you're gonna be you know far worse off than than if you come at it as as humans trying to come up with a cool project together. Totally, yeah. I use the phrase. Maybe the reason that the phrase like "earn the right" comes to mind is because I think a lot of companies that 
at like in a smaller size or in the early days or anybody who's not Nike kind of looks at a Nike and or a, a Gucci partnership or whatever and they say oh we can't do those complicated things because we're not them and I think 100%. the truth is that if you just build great relationships, then you can do really crazy stuff. Like if people really trust you and want to do things with you and are interested in like the creative process, uh, like collaborating on the creative process, then I think there's so, so, so much to do, um, regardless of the size of the company. Uh, so yeah. yeah the I'm thesis is you impressed. don't need a hundred million dollars to sign a famous sports celebrity. You can just come at it nicely <laughs> and you might be able to have a cool partnership too. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think I think businesses are so easily self limiting on that. Of, yeah, we 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 could never, we can't do that for five years, ten years, whatever it might look like. Um, and some of it's just kind of playing and and seeing where things can can stick or feel aligned. Absolutely, um, it's a great segue into commercials. I think when we heard about this, we were really interested how you structured the deal. So how did it kind of look what were the deliverables in some sense yeah um so deliverable wise and you know this is a partnership that's been going on for a few years so as as times time has gone on that certainly evolved what that looks like um you know that ranges from the content so the you know stories posts reels if it's cross-platform it, you know we started really primarily on instagram but there's you know certainly ripple effects into tiktok as that platform came up and exploded um and then as instagram has its identity crisis over is it tiktok is it not um that's been a weird one that's a whole other episode we could do um you know so there was very specific sort of you know what the content type is going to look like and what the platform is going to look like but then also the projects that we planned out for the year right so in that launch year, I mentioned there was, you know, this sort of mega kitchen project, right? Really just giving as much fuel to the collection as possible from the start. Um, but then also on the brand side, I think this is one that we're asking of things of our creators. We also have to bring something to the table. And obviously, yes, that's compensation. That's, you know, commissions, whatever that looks like. But there's also other things that as a brand, we can really elevate that partnership with. You know, on our side, there's things like running supporting ads, um, digital PR. That's a huge one for us um, has been we've been able to secure some really amazing placement for for the collection for Angela, um, you know, press release, obviously, for the launch. But then things like Better Homes and Gardens, Domino, Apartment Therapy, Realtor. I mean, we've our press list makes me excited every time that I look at it. But a lot of those things are really something that we bring value to our creators for when we're able to say, you know, hey, we can get your project, your kitchen into this publication, that's really bringing value on our side beyond just the dollars and cents to change hands. Super cool. Okay, so you you took uh, you took the partnership and you said, hey, one thing we can contribute to this is doing um, PR that otherwise you wouldn't get, and this is a great opportunity for us to boost you, boost us. It's a win win. Um, very cool. Another awesome example of just bolstering getting creative this is another thing it's uh it's so funny somehow the themes are, are uh, often repetitive the stories are always different but the themes always repeat and one of the themes is always uh get creative about what you can do in negotiation and in the partnership and to build the relationship and to make the most out of the out of the activation in general um so very very cool and is it true so was the whole co-branded cabinets line did you do compensation on a commission level like you do the you did the you of course uh, sweetened the deal so to speak by doing these other engagements pushing it in yeah. in um better homes and gardens and so on but then the core comp was commission based is that true yeah or did I miss yeah something? so with with co-branded nice. collections that's that's pretty standard you know you hear the word commission royalty um, you know, all kinds of different terms get tossed around, but essentially in any of these, these deals, it's a, some form of a fee based on a percentage of sales. Um, that's, you know, that's typical, whether that's conversations we've had with, you know, big HGTV type names, whether that's, you know, co-branded collections that came to be, um, commissions or royalties, really standard. One of the things that we've brought to the table, um, that really in this sort of adding value is also, you know, you can have a collection with a creator and that's amazing and there's value for them and obviously their name is on it. But then 
there's also added value that you can bring by incentivizing their audience through the use of things like coupon codes or affiliate links. And there can also be additional compensation that can come out of those. You know, if we know that this this talent is driving audiences to our website, if someone's not necessarily purchasing that collection's product, but they like that creator and they've been incentivized in some way by that creator, then it's also natural for us as a brand to reward that sale or that that view. Um, so this is also something that is, you know, I, I would say less standard than the commission or the royalty, um, but we are starting to see a little bit more the use of affiliate links, the use of coupon codes that are creator specific, sort of in tandem with co-branded lines. Typically it was, you have your co-branded or you have your, your affiliate. And there's a, there's a way to bring both in, especially in this, you know, getting creative world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just another way that, that brands can bring something to the table. Yeah, it's really cool. I think a lot of the folks we speak to, they often have the assumption that for some reason, a creator wouldn't accept a certain commi- like uh, compensation structure with with them or for that activation or, or what have you. And I think, yeah, maybe getting creative, the what I really, what, how this puzzle pieces together in my head is um, there's always a way to structure a deal in a way that will reach whatever value you think that the creator is worth and what they think they're worth. And so um, I'm not sure that there are rules like no commissions with big creators. It turns out, well, if you're doing a co-branded line and the deal makes sense and there's this PR on the side and there's a perfect match between the creator and the brand, then it works perfectly. Uh, and probably if some of those other things weren't there, then maybe commission isn't enough. And so it's this um, this balance, I think that's. I think I think that's so true. I think part. there's, you know, structuring deals is always difficult. Whether it's a co-branded deal or a you know a one-off partnership, it's sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's really not. But I think I think both as creators and as brands, we have to come at the particularly that first conversation with where is the value i mean that's that's really a Mm -hmm. basic foundation of negotiations but where let's let's not get into numbers everyone take a second what is the value that us as a brand can bring what's the talent going to bring what's the talent's bandwidth you know is this a we're going to get two pieces of content out of the year just because of how full their calendar is okay let's let's put all that into this pot and then let's make a nice partnership soup um you know it, i think <laughs> so often especially as as someone who's you know typically receiving media kits or, or talking members so often the first thing is here's my rates and although you know awesome know your worth know what you know certainly have an understanding of what you want to see out of a partnership it's it's interesting how sometimes that's the first thing that comes out versus here's the value I can bring to your brand. I'm interested in your brand for X, Y, Z reason. And I think when we can sort of have that conversation as a level two, but really establish the mutual value first, it makes the money thing a lot easier. And it makes a negotiation really the where can we add value, you know, sweeten the pie, all of all of that. But when we start without any of those pieces it's just harder it's a harder conversation to have love it anything else you want to say about how you structured deliverables or comp for the co-branded line or shall we keep going i think we can keep rolling yeah i think that's a good good bit of it (laughs) all right the the juicy part the thing everybody wants to know what was the impact in the end did you hit your objectives um you said earlier everything isn't perfectly measurable, but I still want to know what was the result. What's the ROI? <laughs> we hit Tell all me about of those the objectives that we can't easily define. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if only reporting was that easy. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many things that that really went well with this collaboration. Um, one we sort of touched on, a huge one that I think is often not considered is the opportunity for PR. Um, you know, new placement that wasn't previously available to us. I think our company's amazing. I could, you know, reach out to all these publications and say, we're cool to talk about us. But talking about just a brand on its own is a little bit less exciting for the press than, you know, brand plus creator or a new collection or pretty photos of kitchen, all of those things. So 
that certainly opened a channel to us that hadn't really been as available previously. And also just the case study. I mean, here's this gorgeous after photo and here's what this kitchen looked like. And this person didn't even rip out a cabinet box and they did it themselves. Like, obviously the press want that. It's, it's a very different type of story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then there's also the impact across channels, right? So influencer marketing, I like to think of as, I said at the beginning, it's not just a performance channel. It can be the tide that lifts all ships. So, you know, there's a boost in direct traffic. There's certainly a boost in branded search, right? People have heard this name associated with another creator's name. Lots of Googling going on with our brand name in mind. You know, PPC is impacted as your site traffic grows. You can see some reduced cost per click marketing. So many things that go beyond just did the product sell or did the collection perform? which, I mean, it certainly did. Um, Our launch day was just something that I will never forget and probably why I said this is one of my proudest um, (laughs) collections. There were so many site users just on that first launch day, you know, coming and checking out what we were all about, purchasing our little sample kits, booking calls with us, just so much of that launch day activity that was just, it was crazy. It was a really, really incredible thing to be a part of. And then interesting to see, you know, it wasn't just this launch day and then disappear, right? There was obviously this flurry of activity, but then as as time went on, as the kitchen renovation unfolded, that sort of funnel of interest or just window shopping to actual user behavior really became evident. People started to take those next steps and and, and sort of move beyond just window shopping or, or discovery. Totally. I'm there's I have so many questions. I can already kind of imagine the excitement of the flood. You look open Google Analytics in the morning and it's like bangs so that you've yeah. uh, you've launched a rocket. So there cool. was a lot of eating um, ramen on the couch all day because that was <laughs> that was really all that all that could be done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a cool thing. Um, it was a really cool thing. Yeah, it must have been uh it's always funny when you have those launch moments that go super well. Uh really exciting, especially for um, you know, maybe if you're if you're in a a massive company doing your 18th partnership with Kim Kardashian, then you kind of lose the feeling. But when you're really building something that you're proud of and that you love, and the whole collaboration comes together, and then it also works, uh, it's so cool. Um, can you talk a little bit more about some of those less tangible, more difficult to measure things that you mentioned? For example, you mentioned like boost in organic search and and PPC costs coming down. Were you able to maybe over what time frame did you see that? And I'm curious, how did you kind of think about deciding that that was the cause and effect, if that makes sense? I think some people get so bogged down in the numbers that they have a hard time saying, well, the post went up today. And then all of the keywords that people started suddenly Googling on the same day, we started ranking for um, and there's probably some correlation there. Some people will, they want such specific correlation. I'm curious how you thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, specific, yeah, specific correlation feels nice, but it's not, it's not accurate to painting the picture of, of what the, of what the, the collaboration's necessarily done. Um, so, you know, there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a few things, right? Using UTM parameter, parameterized links, the word I can never say. Um, That's a really natural one to see, you know, what is direct traffic, right? People typing www.newcabinetdoors.com. Okay, cool. But was that a direct link click through a blog, through a story, through a, you know, where did that, that link come from? Certainly helps with some of this just data ambiguity that can happen. Um, But to the, to the PPC point or the organic search point, you know, certainly the really strong measurable performance, the sort of easy to say this is what's happening pieces are on your branded search, right? So if you're a mm-hmm. business people don't really know about, you're not necessarily a household name, ranking for your own brand name or the volume of searches for your own brand name, maybe not super plentiful. Um, you know, the cost per click for your own brand name, you always hope that that's one of your lowest channels is paying for ads <laughs> for yourself. Um, but as that brand awareness grows, whether it's, you know, through a commercial or through a co-branded deal, you should see those things coming down, right? You should see Mm -hmm. more search volume behind your brand name. You should see lower cost per click on your PPC ads for your own brand name. And hopefully you're also seeing 
an actual increase in search queries for your brand. Obviously, it's great if we're Mm -hmm. number one, but if 10 people are searching for us, it's very different than if that number has has increased to two or 3,000. So I think those are some of the the more measurable ones. And then also looking at on a, you know, if you're working in Google Analytics for now, GA4, which has taken away so much functionality. Um, (laughs) So difficult to work with now. Um, You know, what is your social traffic channel look like? What do, you know, looking at things Mm -hmm. holistically, looking at your traffic mix, did all traffic skyrocket and now all traffic has stayed elevated? Or did all traffic skyrocket and now, you know, just direct is is staying strong? So are people finding that link somewhere? Did they save it somewhere? Um, Looking at, you know, graphs tell us a story that can help us drill down into more detailed numbers. I never underestimate the power of just looking at trends and then sort of diving into what those can actually tell us, especially over time span. I think you said, you know, how immediate are things? Sometimes they're immediate, but with any creator partnership, I think sometimes it's, we got to look at the 30, 60, 90 day effect, Uh, especially with a product like ours. It's not, you know, we joke, we're not selling socks (laughs) we're selling, you know, thousands of dollars of, of kitchen product. So there's, there's certainly an extended time frame to make a purchase decision from a user. Absolutely. And imagine like you follow Angela Rose and then you you also subscribe to Home and Garden. And so you see the content the first time you open the site and a month passes and you get your Home and Garden arrives and you open the page and you go, oh yeah, I saw that. That was really cool. And then you go purchase. And so I think um, it's really useful to think through the actual customer journey behind the activation in order to understand what its impact might be. Because it's so unfair. Imagine if internally there, you have to fight for the idea that a lot of folks we talk to, you know, they're trying to explain to their CMO that uh, you can't think of this as one Instagram post. That's totally unfair. It's a much bigger activation. We can't look at how many likes the Instagram post got. Uh, or how many swipe ups led to immediate checkouts. It has to be a combination of that and everything else. And um, yeah, totally love it. One thing that we saw uh, that was really interesting in our own partnerships is with organic search results is you can actually uh, drive uh, non-branded search results up in the SERP using creators, which is kind of fun. So in Cabinet Door's case, just as an example for the audience, um, what you might do is say, uh, say you want to rank for the phrase green cabinet doors. Then uh, if you if you're if the CTA in the content your creators are publishing starts to include the, the, the call to action, just Google for uh, green cabinet doors by new. Uh, then suddenly lots of people start Googling for this. And now you are the authority on green cabinet doors in Google's mind. Um, and you'll see those rankings pop really quickly in our experience, uh, which has been super fun and last for a very long time too. Um, so little SEO hack on the side. Um, but so uh, you have this life-changing day uh, uh, or this this um, partnerships changing day. The team's excited. You're eating your ramen. Um, and uh, and so overall, I think that uh, I think it's fair to say that this partnership was a success, um, and uh, and you really uh, you really engage people on that day. How lasting would you say the effect is? And uh, I'm curious also, what was Angela's perspective afterwards? What did she was she uh, happy with the result and excited about it? How did it go afterwards? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it was it was also unique in that it was the first co-branded collection Angela had launched um, since she's launched nice. several others. There's flooring, there's rugs, um, so it was it was fun that it was really this first thing for, for both sides. Um, you know, she was thrilled. We were texting all day, like, how's it going? My audience is so excited. I'm like, I'm still eating my ramen. Um, you know, it was, again, just that, you know, that relationship side made it fun to, to be exchanging that excitement together. Um, you know, and, and now years later, things are still going strong. We've added, you know, some product to the collection. We started with just the two doors. We've added this new wood grain door. Um, and then also as we figured out, you know, have we, what stories have we told? What stories have we not? There's also been an opportunity. It's the same collection, but how can we talk to more of an Ikea audience versus a refacing audience? Who have we maybe not spoken to and how can we tell that story with the same collection? Um, And that's really been something that we've sort of explored 
and, and continue to and how we can use the product and the collection differently. Awesome. Love it. Then on to our next topic, really the purpose and how the mentality at new faces creator partnerships in general. Um, so you've been wildly successful with some of these activations, uh, with many of them seemingly. You've done many complicated integrations. You've invested a lot of effort into this channel. Um, how do you think about it internally? What does the team think? Do they? Do you think of it as as a as a performance channel? Then I think based on our conversation so far, it's obvious that you do think of it cross functionally. We've gone pretty deep there. Um, but maybe more broadly speaking, is there anything more to say about how you think about its success or uh, what the impact that people should look for is when they either start out or start scaling up these partnerships? Yeah, and I think you touched on one, right? You know, we can't just write off a how something performed <clears throat> based on if if it got enough likes or comments, right? So certainly it can be a performance channel, but it's kind of an everything channel. I think I said, you know, that sort of tide that can lift all your ships. I think all channels can lift all channels. Then that's that's the way that we t we tend to look at our our marketing strategy. Um, the biggest one is that digital marketing seems to be losing data by the day. I mean, all these privacy changes, how long, you know, it's just, it's getting really, it used to be so nice and buttoned up and like this did this, and then we can track this and woohoo. And that's lovely. That's comfortable. That's easy to sell to management, but it's getting more ambig ambiguous. Wow. Um, and I think influencer marketing almost might have a advantage now as things are getting a little ambiguous because parts of it can be ambiguous. So, you know, we mentioned it can be a direct acquisition channel, particularly if you're selling socks, it can be that, you know, see it, want it, click, buy it. But it's also, there's a huge component of it that's building that brand trust, brand awareness, you know, in, especially in e-commerce with, you know, scammy companies popping up sort of weird, it's easy to pay for advertising and take someone's money and then close up shop and run away having influencer partnerships can also help add some of that legitimacy to an otherwise fully digital brand. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about that sort of recall and brand awareness of brand name X creator name um, that that can really drive a lot for you. Um, I also think we can't underestimate the power of getting people on site and what they then might do. Right. So there's the opportunity to remarket to them. Maybe they join your email list, even if their kitchen is two or three years down the road. What does that activation look like in terms of getting that new contact or that new opportunity to to speak to that person in, in some other marketing channel? Love it. And does the rest of the team feel the same way? Have Has there been any resistance to, hey, I want to do these crazy partnerships and I can't quite tell you how many dollars they'll return? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, I've talked about this in... Um, in a few different platforms. I think influencer marketing, for anyone that's listening and is like, how the heck do I sell this to my team? That's okay that it's going to feel a bit awkward. It is going to be difficult to measure in some ways. I think there are ways we can control that and make it less risky depending on the kinds of budgets that you're working with. Mm -hmm. A great way to look at you know, how we can sort of compare it to a performance channel is look at, so if we look at, think about cost per click marketing. Okay, great. Well, that's nice. That's measurable. That's easy to comprehend. Let's look at an influencer. Let's look at their audience. So let's look at, look at their engaged followers. Let's look at how many eyeballs that could be. Let's apply some logic of if 1% of those eyeballs do something, what does that look like? What's the cost that I'm paying for this partnership? And now you have a cost per click with influencer marketing. Right. There are some ways we can make this less just I'm having a person talk about me. And so and and if there's a compelling story there that so few people would have to do a thing for this to outperform our PPC, can we test it? I think coming at it as let's try it is, you know, make a case for it, have a bit of data where you can, but yeah, testing and playing with it is going to help get buy-in versus making just the case we have to take all our money to influencer marketing or also just saying, you know, oh, it's, I understand that's going to be difficult to track. Let's not do it because it, it feels risky, right? You can control 
working with a smaller scale influencer, working with a smaller budget. There's a lot of ways you can dig into it without it having to be this highly risky, you know, million dollar partnership. Yeah, I think usually what is scary is the unknown. And so the more visibility you have into your whole funnel that currently exists, how many of your site visitors turn into customers on average, how yeah. much, how many of them can you retarget, like you mentioned earlier, if you have good visibility into those things, then you can start to build a much better thesis around expectations, because you can set relatively low expectations, but have uh, expectations across a series of metrics, and then you make it, uh, you can make a really compelling case. So, hey, we know an impression on social is generally worth this much to us. We know that a, cl a click to the site is generally worth this much to us. Uh, we know that of those site clickers, we can retarget this many of them and drive a purchase next year. And as long as you have a thesis that ends up at least being a little bit ROI positive in the beginning, it's often uh, easy to get the buy-in for a test budget, like you said. Um, and yeah. then I think maintaining that visibility over time, talking about it internally. The, crazy, the cool thing about working in the space is that everyone's excited when when Angela Rose publishes that day, you know, everyone's going to check and see what's going on and what's the result and what's happening. And so when you uh, open up to the rest of the team and have a little public channel where anyone can can look and see, oh, this is the status of the activation. We're going live on this day. We're going live tomorrow. She's going to publish this, this, and this, and we expect this result. Oh my God, it's working. She published. <laughs> try, the site is down. Send help. Send more like, ramen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the yeah. more visibility you provide, the easier it is for people to get excited. Um, and so, so that's super key, I think, into getting that. I also think. You know, depending on we talked about authenticity and, and partnerships with our creators, we can get a lot of data on our side. But this is also a great opportunity to to work into those initial conversations. And as as something's going live, you know, why not have an open channel with that creator for them to share the data? Right. We we can't get into their device and see the swipes, the shares, the this is the that's. But if that's information that's valuable to you which it is, um, if that's something that they're open to sharing with you in screenshot form, you know, it doesn't have to be every hour or something. But, you know, if you could say, hey, at the end of the 24 hour story, do you mind just just grabbing a screen share of, of what that story did? Or can you send me what your your analytics in your in your app look like? If that's something that you talk about at the start, but, you know, you're not asking for something after a project has begun that's out of line. But if it's brought brought forth at the beginning, that just adds to the data that you can bring in, right? If you can say, huh, they saw this many, you know, interactions, clicks, swipe ups, but we didn't quite see the same thing on our end. Hmm, let's dig into that or let's understand maybe how we can improve upon that for next time. Um, I would I would say don't ever discount that a creator might be willing to share that information with you. It's always worth the conversation. Nice. Just to put in uh, a really sweet bow on attribution and measuring impact, um, can you rattle off a few of the metrics that you're typically on any given campaign might be measuring in influencer partnerships? Yeah. Um, so, you know, UTM link parameters, link clicks, uh, we're looking at uh, coupon code usage, right? If it's a, yeah, it's a code based thing, uh, code usage, we're looking at uh, on platform likes, comments, shares. Uh, we're looking at within. Instagram stories, we're looking at views relative to link clicks, relative to sort of all of the different activations, depending on what the CTA might be in there. Um, and then also on our end, we're looking at site traffic, channel traffic, particularly when an activation goes live. Is it primarily social? Is it primarily direct? Is it you know, where does that makeup go? Um, those are my quick rattle offs. There's a lot that you can look at in this world of no data data. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I love that you had tied into uh, before is bringing time into the equation. So when yeah. do the customers start engaging relative to the activations? I really 100%. love that note. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's another just... thing. Oh, interrupting each other. Okay. Um, it's another thing. Time is time is so valuable, right? We're, we're losing the ability to, to have data beyond 24 hours with with all of the, the new privacy changes. So we can't assume, particularly in our model, that 
the activation is successful within a 24-hour time span. We have to look at, and, and that can be brought in with the use of affiliate links, coupon codes, things like that. You know, this recall, get organized, measure your kitchen, do the thing. That takes so much time. And, you know, our model might be a little unique to what some of the listeners are are working in. For, it might be a quicker purchase timeline. But I think that's, that's something we always have to keep in mind is how little time we actually can have data on things. And so we have to we have to look at it over a, a 30, 60, 90, 120 to really see how something is performing realistically. Totally. Yeah. Especially many of the social platforms, just the nature of them is that a piece of content might change drastically in how it's delivered in the next six months. And uh, yep. depending on exactly how your framework works, or maybe part of the deliverables won't even happen for 30 days. And so uh, don't yep. call your, call your, don't count your chickens before they hatch. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> maybe one last thing on building a thesis around attribution, since I can't get this thought out of my head. I think um, one one thing that I see companies do, especially in consumer, is for some reason they feel like they're uniquely bound by some law of the universe that something can't work for them. And I think you can do much more if you start from the assumption that um, you know if you're if you're selling direct to consumer through e-commerce, a beautiful product like um, cabinet doors, for example, then you probably can start from the assumption that. Creator partnerships could work if only we did the right things to make it work. Yeah. And then from there, figure out what the equation is. And if you're not really willing to commit to it in that way, I think a lot of the times it won't work. If you start with the assumption it won't work, then you'll kind of set yourself up for failure generally. Um, but if you're selling e-commerce, direct-to-consumer um, products, especially with some margin, uh, which is a good transition to our next question, but uh, then it's likely creator partnerships should work. And the question is, how do you get them to work? And I think it's a really yeah. um, underspoken about piece of the equation. But yeah, why you, why count yourself out of something? And if you haven't tried it, let's just absolutely. don't do that. <laughs> get a test totally, budget. Yeah. Come at it positively I and see what you can do. I swear tomorrow I'll do a call with a company that's uh, that's doing custom cabinet door uh, in, implementation and somebody mentioned influencer marketing internally and then somebody else rolled their eyes and said yeah right no one's gonna buy custom doors from instagram and that's yeah. like squashed the whole vibe <laughs> of the conversation hey guys i, I have a I, podcast that, on that <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah i'm just gonna send them the link um yeah but fantastic so um new super successful with all kinds of creator partnerships uh, and one interesting thing about you is the the kind of cost and upfront investment there's a little bit of time investment as well consideration that goes into the purchase for the customer um, so it's probably not that impulse cap uh, like impulse instagram story swipe up purchase so how do you think about um, the length of your collaborations based on our conversation so far i can tell that probably you're you're using these across the whole customer journey um but yeah uh short-term collaborations versus long-term how do you think about them what do you like and how does that relate to your uh kind of acv um, of having yeah. a higher ticket item yeah so we definitely we definitely look at things on a on a project basis more than a number of days basis which i think can be a bit unique to some to some brands so you know you don't wake up and decide to renovate your kitchen I think I do every morning, um, but I'm weird. <laughs> so, you know, most people, whether this is their first introduction to the concept that they could reface their their kitchen, or if this is a reminder from a, you know, an influencer and a trusted voice, that purchase timeline takes a while. So with our partnerships, every partnership we do is a hands-on partnership, first off. We don't do partnerships where we just say, talk about us, and here's some cash, right? So there's there is the tactile watching somebody use the product, the befores, the afters, the hands-on, all of that goes into the storytelling. And because of that, we have a project timeline. So if it's a you know quick bathroom vanity refresh, that might only be a 30-day project because it's, hey, I'm using these doors. I ordered my doors. I put my doors on. Look at my pretty vanity. Versus a kitchen, you know, that takes a while depending on what else is going on in the space. So we, we come at it project-based, not number of days-based, because we also want to be realistic as people that 
stuff's going to happen. You're going to start your kitchen reno and then you're going to find out you have to move electrical or, you know, things come up that if we say it's only X days and you got to just mention the brand as many times as you can within that days, it, it just doesn't make sense for our, for our product type. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I really love um, visualizing the whole customer journey and imagining what stories the customer needs to hear in each aspect of that journey. So um, maybe the first one, maybe the first story they hear about is like, I'm considering renovating my kitchen. Yeah. Uh, I found this cool brand called New Cabinet Doors. <laughs> and, and then from there, it's like, you know what? I finally... Um, I finally convinced my spouse to to buy into this idea, and now we're we're really thinking we're going to do this this year. And then another yeah. month goes by, and it's like we talked to a to the to the brand, and they told us this. It was a great experience, but we did learn our electricals all screwed up. We got to fix that first, and yeah. then it's the next thing. And then suddenly you have this magic that happens, and you can kind of be with the customer along their journey and just yeah. uh, tell the stories they need to hear um, as it goes. I, I love that. Um, how strict are you folks on like controlling that story generally, the creative requirements? We're very strict. We're very strict. strict. Um, Hardcore. <laughs> I mean, we, I think, I, I think we're, we're not very strict in terms of, I like to look at it as we have expectations. Expectations are great. We have clear expectations for what the deliverables will be, you know, at what point in the project are you going to do a share, whether that's to your point that before that I'm thinking about it. Hey, did you know you could reface your kitchen? Whatever that might be, you know, the in progress, the reveal, those things are clearly laid out. But we also give a lot of flexibility to creators to create, <laughs> you know, we can have ideas idea. of how we want to come at something. But ultimately, they know their audience best. They know what kind of content is performing best for them. You know, I know some brands, it's you will say these words. You will send it to me three weeks in advance. I won't answer you for four weeks. And like, that's just, that's not effective for, for creators. And that's something we hear time and time again in how we come at collaborations is like, here's what we're going to expect from you. Here's going to be some talking points. Here's things that are really great for your audience to hear. How do you want to come at it? And there's there's a dialogue. There's a, a partnership, uh -huh, partnerships, um, <laughs> of making sure that that works for them, right? I, you know, we would never want a creator to feel that they have to post something that day and that time if they're going, you know what, guys, my Thursdays just are dropping off in terms of, of you know, actual interaction. It would be better if we did this Friday afternoon. Let's talk about that. Let's, you know, let's make sure that that flexibility is there um that when it's just so prescriptive you you can't see the same impact and it's it's for everyone's benefit the the partnership will perform better when we can come at things collaboratively totally i love it i love that def de definition breakdown C turns out creators are great at creating things Amazing. and it turns out the when idea of a partnership is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and partnerships are about like collaboration, and of yeah. course, giving a little bit of structure and setting clear expectations, but also being open to to new ideas and um, and exploring new angles and letting the creator do that job that they're so good at. Um, I love it. So you're doing these long term collaborations. Do you see that the audience gets saturated, uh, or is your product kind of complex enough that you have lots of time to work with the audience without it? Uh, without them getting fatigued, so to say. Yeah, we're, I'd say we're pretty good at, you can hear about us a few times and you're not tired of us. It, the story can change and evolve so much that we're not just, you know, mm -hmm. hammering the same message all the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's it's a natural fit with the, the process a customer goes through mentally to decide if this is a fit for them, but also the creator can have a different story every time they pop on with our product. So creatively, we don't hear about creative fatigue or like, how the heck do I talk about my cabinet doors another time? And then also audience wise, it's just such a natural flow that that we don't see that that fatigue. Got you. OK, I think lots of people fear that, oh, the audience already heard about us last month. Um, they're going to be so annoyed that we keep spamming them. And the truth is that they forgot about you immediately if uh, yeah. unless that creative was absolutely exceptional and i think i think it's uh, seth godin maybe with the seven times rule that people have to hear about you seven times before they remember you and 
Um, yeah. Especially if the creative is great and you're actually giving them something of value, the audience, then they're happy to hear about you many, many times. Of course, if you're going to post the same like swipe up to buy my purse uh, post like 10 times in a day, then yeah. it's uh, then yeah. you, you leave the wrong impression. <laughs> Yeah. To continue on creative, jumping over a little bit here uh, and getting into authentic creative, which um, yeah. is a, you've talked a lot about how the enthusiasm of the of the partner matters and of the brand matters. And I think all of that comes uh, comes back to create this like authentic story with a little bit of guidance, but a little bit of that uh, creative excellence that creators bring. Um, so new is expert in this. How do you um, how do you think about what authentic content looks like and maybe a good way to illustrate it is uh is there examples of inauthentic influencer collabs i always i always ask about uh how to make great things but what do bad things look like yeah yeah there and there's a couple that oh i see and i just they it just makes me grumpy every time i see them um <laughs> you know i i <laughs> um i think really inauthentic the inauthentic ones are the ones first off audiences find it inauthentic when 10 to 15 to 20 creators who they follow do the exact same thing on the exact same day with the exact same code and the exact same discount. It can be impactful because you're like, wow, brand a has a sale. I guess I have to pick who's going to get my affiliate usage today. <laughs> People don't think about that. Um, but you know, that can be one of those sort of like hammering a message at people, which can be effective, but also can just seem so fake because it seems as though, you know, money changed hands for you to read the script for everybody to do it at the same time on the same day. And I think audiences are starting to become more attuned to that type of marketing and it's losing its efficacy. Um, you know, there's also, I mean, it's just... Anyways, it makes me, ugh, I hate it. Um, <laughs> but even if you were to stagger, if you were to sign 20 or 30 creators and you were to stagger that, like a couple go this day or this time, then a few hours later, this one, and then the next day, you know, that just feels more natural unless it's some kind of like crazy 24 hour flash sale, which usually they aren't. But then also if, if I put myself in a creator's shoes, that now it's competitive, right? Now I'm hoping that you use my link instead of my friend's link, because <laughs> there's a percentage in it for me. So it also kind of dilutes the opportunity for success across creators if it is a affiliate or a commission structure. Um, and I just think it's, yeah, it's just losing a lot of, losing a lot. Especially, yeah, totally. Especially if you're really aiming for this like uh, life cycle driven, what story can we tell to actually help the customer then and you're again the customer needs to move through that journey in order to make a purchasing decision if you're just bombarding like a super scripted message i think what do you think maybe you disagree with me but i think you it's okay to do say a thousand partnerships in a day if you can also manage to get those partnerships to feel like if the creators are enthusiastic if the story is good is interesting and helpful maybe um and if they're not delivered in this very cookie cutter yeah. um copy paste oh, yeah. way that you described uh and uh, on staggering um like you said i think you can also stagger who is talking about which stories at which times to which audiences uh, and you can yeah. be running tons of partnerships but everyone's got a slightly different angle and is helping me with a different step of this decision and um yeah yeah agreed agreed N no <laughs> argument to be had there then no, i don't think so wow We've already reached the end. Oh, already. I guess it has been an hour. Time, time flies when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> uh, this what question is, this is question? asking for an We just argument, don't have to I talk think. about it if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Okay, that is a great question. Actually, it just took me a second to get my head wrapped around it, I think. So the, um, our last question is about the future, uh, an apt way to end a great show, I think. Um, how do you think about the the future for new for creator partnerships there, uh, and especially in regard to scaling this whole thing? Is that the goal? Is that what you're aiming for? And how will you make it happen? I think for you know for our brand and the way that we work with talent and have established ourselves with talent, I think we'll always continue to be very hands on for the you know for the next while. 
Um, there, I think there's certainly things you can scale, like, you know, creator discovery, analytics, you know, working on sort of the data side of things, or even your outreach, you, you can start to get into at a, a larger scale. Um, you know, even something like having a, a tiered system where maybe, you know, accounts with following X to Y have sort of this offer, and then larger partnerships become more customized. Um, you know, because we tend to work with sort of fewer and more high touch partnerships, I can see us continuing this way for, for time to come. But certainly, as the business grows and our partnerships grow, yeah, there's going to be ways to streamline for sure. Nice. Awesome, Terry. I appreciate you so much. Busy end of year. I know you still have a few days, working days left in the year. Yep. Um, so I really appreciate the time. And I think you're so articulate. It's going to be so helpful for the folks that, that listen through. Um, thank you very much for being here. Is there anything you want to plug if, for those who are still here? I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't be a good uh, creator partnerships manager if I didn't say check us out. Um, you know, we, yeah. you can find us on socials, uh, new cabinet doors, N-I-E-U. Um, if you need help with your kitchen, chat with our friendly team. And I think to anyone listening who is sort of, you know, do I even try this thing called influencer marketing? Hopefully this gave you some helpful takeaways. And uh, thanks so much, Avery, for having me. It's been a really fun time chatting. Yeah. Nice. I'm glad to hear. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And um, the links to all of news uh, things and to Terry will be below as well. So hasta la vista. Arrivederci. Happy holidays. See you later. 